Well, Rogers, thanks so much for coming to visit us here in Monterey. Uh, you were great with the students today and raised a number of really important themes. Perhaps the most important one is your point about the rising requirements in the cyber arena, the rising threats, and the restricted resources. And what I'd like to know from you is uh, where you see NPS, the Naval Postgraduate School, in helping you to confront this dilemma. So the, the value that Naval Postgraduate School provides me as commander of the United States Cyber Command is you are helping to build the workforce of the future by educating the men and women here at Monterey who in turn, as they leave Monterey, will go on to be part of the cyber mission force, leading some of those cyber teams we're creating, helping us deal with policy and other issues, being leaders and staff officers in the field for us. You are helping to develop the intellectual capital of the future because cyber, like every other area, has an underpinning of operational concepts, strategic thought, that's an area that we need to be spending more time on. And postgraduate school here in Monterey is so well positioned to help us do that. You've got great technical capability here. So how do we maximize that? Are there projects, research that both the students and faculty could be doing that pay off in the long run? So I'm very high on the value of Naval Postgraduate School, which is one reason why I am out here in Monterey. I also loved your use of history and analogy to think about this time. Cyber is a very new domain, and yet you've been able to find the parallels with earlier eras, not least the period before World War II, where we faced a number of design challenges, were attacked by surprise. The 9-11 of that era was Pearl Harbor, and yet responded swiftly, skillfully, and decisively. Would you say a few words about how that design challenge was mastered and how we might face this one? So I, I try to remind people, look, the mismatch between requirements and resources is not something new. And if you go back in the 20s and 30s, we had a Navy at the time where money was so tight, we generally were focused on one single exercise as the ultimate fleet maneuver, if you will. We were not forward deployed in the same way. We had people on the China Station, elsewhere around the world, but it wasn't the same model. And even though money was tight, we came to the conclusion that some of the ways to compensate is to spend a lot of time on intellectual and operational development. How do we think about the concepts that we're gonna need in the future as we generate more resources over time? And so almost everything that we took for granted in the Second World War in the Western Pacific, we actually did the foundational work back in the 30s. Cyber is much the same way to me. We're in a, an environment now where Threat and risk is accelerating rapidly. You see that in Sony. You see that every day in the major intrusions we're dealing with, both within the broad U.S. economy as well as against the Department of Defense. Even as threats rising, resources potentially decreasing, clearly a mismatch between what we think are requirements and what we think are resource levels the department needs. Not unique to cyber. We're dealing now at his apartment right now. So the power of intellect, the power of thought, becomes an incredible hedge and a real force equalizer for us. I try to remind people, as technically focused as cyber is, don't ever forget that in the end, it is the intellect and the heart of the men and women in the mission set. That's our edge, that's what's gonna get us success, not just the technology. I think that's such an important point, especially for us at the Naval Postgraduate School, where we have a great deal of technical expertise, but also we're very much invested in thinking through issues of strategy and policy. And uh, another of the analogies you talked about was um, nuclear strategy. And a lot of the ideas about that, about deterrence, came from the academy, from civilian universities and, and think tanks. Is there a similar role for um, military education and indeed for civilian universities to help develop cyber strategy, policy, doctrine? I mean, I definitely think there is. It's one of the reasons, again, why I'm out in Monterey. Every time I'm in the Valley, for example, um, I, I spend time at Stanford, over at Berkeley, because I'm trying to argue, again, the academic world can bring some very rich intellectual thought. And just as we did in the nuclear arena, where much of our initial underpinning for those initial concepts of mutually assured destruction and the deterrent concepts that we take for granted today, in the 40s and the 50s, as we were trying to figure out, so what are we going to do with these things? The academic world really helped drive the pursuit of thought. What does deterrent mean in a nuclear framework? How do you control escalation? Much of that work, I, I think, is very analogous to the environment we find ourselves in now, and so I'm really high on the academic world and its capabilities to help us with the intellectual thought piece. 
Admiral, you mentioned Silicon Valley and, and Stanford. They're about 90 minutes away from us uh, here. Are you thinking about what kind of uh, footprint you and the command will have in that area? And, and isn't it its own kind of design challenge to think through how on the defense side we integrate with universities and commercial enterprises to try to think through the security issues in cyberspace? So we are. Um, I have come to the conclusion that the valley and its broader extensions, if you will, um, are a center of gravity within this mission set, that we need to be able to partner and access, partner with, as well as access much of the technology and the intellectual thought that is really churning in the mission set out here in California. And so one of the things that we've looked at, we've created a res an initial, we call it a point of presence, an initial reserve structure on the ground over in Silicon Valley. I'll start relatively small, we'll build it out over time. There's some things we're trying to do in terms of investment. You also talked about the workforce in general, Admiral, and I think it would be very important for our students and our audience to hear your thoughts about the types of human capital you want to develop to fill out the cyber force in the future. So as much as in this mission set, we tend to focus on the technology, I always try to remind people, look, our greatest edge is the men and women who actually execute the mission. Cyber's no different in that regard. And so what we need is a broad set of human capital with a spectrum of capability from the very technical to the planning to the intelligence enablers, for example, to help us understand and characterize this battle space against cyber no different. That it's much more than just get me a whole bunch of computer science graduates. Not that that's not an important component of the structure, but we have got to think more broadly. So if you look at the spectrum of disciplines resident out here at the Naval Postgraduate School, one of the things I talk to the team as we're building that force for the future is, hey, I'm interested in accessing a whole wider swath than just computer scientists, for example. Not that computer scientists aren't of great value to us, but I want operations analysis, operations research. You got mathematicians, what kind of double E backgrounds do you have? What kind of intelligence, um, what kind of planning expertise can we gain access to? We need all of that.